Welcome once again to the Sports Next Door podcast. My name is Owen, and I am joined today by my virtual neighbor, Max. How's it going, my friend? Pretty well, pretty well. A little jealous. You got to catch some sporting action last night and nothing on the table for me, but... <laughs> yes, it was Turkey Day to our friends down south, and uh, the games weren't the best, but they were better than I thought they were going to be, so I can't complain. Yeah, give, give the people having celebrating celebrate fake Thanksgiving something to enjoy. <laughs> Absolutely. So... Before we get into that, some news reverberated around the sporting and greater world this week. Diego Maradona died at 60 of a heart attack. And uh, we've, I think we should start with that. For me personally, I don't know much about him. My earliest memories of famous soccer players starts at Ronaldo and Ronaldinho and later coming Messi. You, on the other hand, grew up playing competitive soccer for most of your life. So tell me a bit about him and what he meant to you as a yeah. player and the legacy he had. Similarly, I never got to really watch him live, but growing up, there was always these videos that they would show in our soccer camps and our training camps, what we'd work on. And he's always in there, right? He was one of those players in any sport where when he has control of the play, like the whole world holds its breath. He's just a special player. And some of the highlights that you see, the runs that he could go on, um, obviously the hand of God is a pretty infamous I moment. But <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's an incredible player and a lot of people looked up to him. And when I was starting out, like everyone wanted to, everyone wanted to be like Maradona. Everyone wanted to be like Ronaldo, Ronaldinho. Uh, David Beckham was one of the big ones during my time because yeah and so he just he meant so much to the world and I mean 2020 just keeps taking from us right we lost Kobe in January and Chadwick Boseman about a month ago and now Maradona so uh, it's tough to see but hopefully he is playing the great game up in the sky with the other greats who have come before him and uh just continue to preserve his legacy on the field by uh, through the new age of players who are treating the game with respect. And uh, there's not much more than that to say. Just like, rest in peace, Maradona. Well said, rest in peace. Moving on, you, there was still a little more soccer you got on your chest to get off. Yeah, so we we have to transition. It's not the easiest transition, but... Uh, A little bit of lower tone to a little bit more of a disappointment as uh, Toronto FC drops their first round playoff matchup to the Nashville Soccer Club, the expansion franchise, and they lost 1-0 and the goal was scored in the second half of extra time. (laughs) And I mean... TFC fans, we can't really complain because, believe it or not, this team has been to the MLS Cup final three of the last five years uh, and won and one championship. All the Toronto like, championship vibes, <laughs> don't, or maybe all the Toronto Maple Leafs vibes just being sucked up by them. Yeah, they, I, yeah they've been a great team the last couple of years. Just Toronto fans, they always want more, right? <laughs> we have such high expectations for no reason. <laughs> But they just they come out flat in some of these really important games, and you could see it down the stretch of the season in the return to play that they had that great run, and then the last couple of games they disengaged. And I mean, it's super embarrassing to lose to an expansion team in the first round of the playoff when you basically had the supporters' shield lost locked up until they lost the last game of the season. So, I mean they've been successful in recent years and can't complain because they were just so terrible every single year before the last five years, but just ask for a little bit more from TFC and we'll see what happens. Greg Vanny got nominated for manager of the year, but when your team comes out flat in a playoff game like that, it's, you might need to look at some change in leadership. Fair enough. What else did you get up to watching this week? So the TFC game is on Wednesday, and then uh, I got to watch some other football on Thursday. And Tell me about it. <laughs> the Thanksgiving games uh, started off 
terribly as we heard that the Steelers and Ravens game was going to get moved to Sunday. That might even get moved further down the week now as Lamar Jackson was diagnosed with COVID-19 yesterday, which is a tough break for the league. Uh, and that game was going to be the the marquee matchup on Thanksgiving. And obviously we didn't get to see that, but um, the other two earlier games sort of made up for it in terms of the expectations were so low and there's lots of scoring. So at least you can uh, be happy with that. But the, the first game, the Lions and the Texans, I'm like Deshaun Watson, he was a difference maker. He's an incredible quarterback and he's just, I, I think I mentioned on the previous podcast, they just haven't been able to protect him and he has been underrated because some of the other quarterbacks around his age are on better teams and performing at a similar level, but he does so much for this Houston Texans team. And then uh, they also benefited from some turnovers. So they had only had five turnovers through 11 weeks this year, and they got three in the first quarter pretty much, which really swung the tide of the game for them. And then of course there was this beautiful backyard football play where Running back had had a stretch to the right, about three seconds. He hadn't reached the line of scrimmage. <laughs> a little toss back to the quarterback. Love it. A little flea flicker and finds Will Fuller wide open. Brutal for me. I'm going up against Deshaun in fantasy this week, so that was crushing. But it was fun to see, so I, I can't be too upset. And then the late game, Cowboys, Washington football team. <laughs> Joe Buck, Troy Aikman on the call, super excited, ramping it up. And it was a great game through three quarters, and then the Cowboys fell apart. Andy Dalton got picked. He basically threw the ball right at the defensive lineman who was coming to sack him, and it got returned for a touchdown. And then terrible fake punt run by the Cowboys. And now the Washington football team is in the driver's seat of the NFC East at 4-7. and seven. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Which is ridiculous to even say <laughs> oh divisions and sports yeah i they need to definitely take a look at how teams make the playoffs when they don't even have a 500 record because it's such an embarrassment to the league that you could potentially have the baltimore ravens who were the second best or the number one seed last year but the baltimore ravens missing the playoffs in the afc and then having this bum washington team hosting a playoff game yeah i mean the <laughs> whole point of the playoffs is to have the best play the best and you sharpen it out and find the number one team and divisions are like a necessary evil with geography and the fact that not every team can play every team equal amount of times and be at their best because they'd be flying all over the place but i feel like with football having a 16 game season that wisdom holds a little less true and there should be something they could possibly do to fix that if it's as bad as sub 500 teams regularly making the playoffs with like amazing teams not getting in that's not why i want to see as a fan of any sport yeah absolutely all right i'm gonna move on to my weekend preview i've selected a couple of games that I'm excited to watch. I mean, the first of which would be the Steelers and Ravens game, which may not end up happening on Sunday. There's no line for it right now because the Ravens facility is shut down uh, until Sunday. So it's most likely that they won't get to play, which sucks because now the Steelers, who already had dealt with COVID issues earlier in the season when they tried to play the Titans and it got moved back a week, now again have to worry about getting their game postponed and somehow they're still undefeated. So it's actually been pretty impressive to see from them. What does that uh, mean? That, is it going to be like a back heavy end right before the playoffs? Well, they're going to have to play a bunch of games. Somehow the NFL has been able to finagle the schedule so far this year. So with that Titans game earlier, it just got moved to the Steelers bye week. So they basically didn't have a bye week this season. And then this game, it'll probably get played on a Monday or a Tuesday. And then I, I don't, the NFL is going to have to deal with this COVID issue because at this point, there's no more bye weeks as we get down the final stretch. So I think what's going to happen is they're going to have to add an extra week to the schedule in order to fit in some of these games that get 
postponed down the stretch. But either way, it's going to be tough for the Steelers. And so it makes that number one seed for them even more important because only one team gets a bye in the playoffs this year as opposed right. to two the, all the previous years. Yeah. The next game that I was looking at uh, is the Kansas City Chiefs and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Chiefs are favored by three and a half right now. And uh, it's going to be Patrick Mahomes versus Tom Brady. And it's an afternoon game, so Brady won't be past his bedtime. He'll put on a good show, hopefully. Uh, And the biggest thing here is just I think it's going to be a shootout because Brady struggles when teams are able to put some pressure on him from their front seven, and the Chiefs' defense is lacking a bit in that regard. And then on the other side, no defense can stop the Chiefs and Mahomes. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. The over-under is set at 56 right now, which is pretty high. So it should be an exciting game. Uh, I'm going to pick the Chiefs for this game just because it's hard to pick against Mahomes. And I think that their defense just makes big plays when they need to make big plays, and they'll be able to win by a touchdown here. So you think it'll come down to the difference between the teams or the difference between Mahomes and Brady? I think it'll be Mahomes and Brady. And Brady makes the right reads, but he's still in that stage where the Tampa Bay offense still isn't 100% clicking, and they may figure it out by the playoffs. But right now, playing the Super Bowl favorite Kansas City Chiefs, he's going to have some – he's still going to – there's still going to be some growing pains there. And so I think just the difference between him and – Mahomes, who has reached that kind of early peak Brady quality where he and his receivers are all on the same page and he knows exactly where to put it. And if you drop back into coverage and everything's covered, he's just, okay, I'm going to scramble for 11 yards first down, keep the chains moving. So uh, I just think the difference there is what's going to be the outcome of this game. Oh, you got me excited to hear about it on Monday. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be an exciting one for sure. Uh, the final game. It's not as exciting as the first two project to be, but it is really important for the AFC playoff picture is the Titans and the Colts going at it for uh, number one seed in the AFC South. And right now the uh, Colts are in the lead because they beat the Titans two weeks ago in their previous matchup. And that game just came down to special teams. I mean, the, the Titans had a muffed punt and then a missed kick. And it really swung the tide in that game. The biggest thing, again, will be can the Titans get pressure on Phillip Rivers? Because when Phillip Rivers has time, this Colts offense has looked really electric. But if there's any sort of pressure on him, then he seems to fold. And then at the same time, the Colts' defense, since Darius Leonard's been back, have been great. And they just need to be able to shut down Derrick Henry. Uh, and I think they're going to do that. So I'm going to pick the Colts here. They're minus three in the spread. Uh, and I'm going to pick them to cover that spread in this game. So it should be a decent weekend. Uh, the last thing I got to talk about is my fantasy, fantasy sleeper for this weekend. And I have Wayne Gallman of the New York football giants going up to Cincinnati. And uh, he has been on a tear recently. And I believe he's going to put up some major points, and I hope so, because that's who I picked up on the waiver wire this week. <laughs> All right. We'll check back in on that Monday. Yeah. All right. That was a good wrap up there. We'll take a quick break, and then I look forward to hearing about your preview for Fight Night. And we're back. Uh, Max is going to walk us through UFC Fight Night coming up on Saturday, and it's going up against the much-awaited – Mike Tyson, Roy Jones pay-per-view, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. First, uh, Max, walk me through some of these fights that stand out to you and what you're looking forward to seeing. Yeah, I'm going to walk you through it uh, top to bottom. So starting at the main event, which is Derek the Black Beast Lewis versus Curtis Razorblades. Rise of Blades. So I believe Blades, last time I checked, was a minus 350 to win. Yeah. And that's kind of where I want to start. Like, I don't want to sell something that's not true. And on first look, Blades is probably going to do what he's done throughout his career and dominate. 
and it's not going to be close. But the more I think about this, there's a couple things that get me interested and excited about this matchup. So the first thing is, or the main consistent part of what makes this interesting is the heavyweight mystical factor, which is you never know what's going to happen in a heavyweight fight. And Derek Lewis embodies that more than any fighter on the roster, probably. We'll talk about his power in a sec, but I actually want to start with his uh, wrestling defense because it's one of the bizarrest things you see. It, he makes solid grapplers look like they've never put on wrestling shoes and don't know how to hold them down because he just gets up like it's not real. Like uh, he fought Blagoy Ivanov about a year ago. Ivanov had him in a crucifix submission, which is a brutal spot to be in and Lewis just stood up wrestling isn't real jujitsu isn't real uh, a couple months back the win he got to earn this shot at blades he was fighting Alexi Olenek who is a nicknamed the boa constrictor because his chokes are insane he can have you lying on top of him and wrap his arms around your neck and choke you out and he got on top of Lewis, which is a much more advantageous spot to be, wrapped those like super terrifyingly strong arms around him, squeezed his hardest, and Lewis's mass, for lack of a better word, just let him survive it. Like it hurt him, it was tight, but he wasn't getting choked out. And almost any other fighter on the roster in that position probably goes unconscious. I so, think it was too thick. Exactly. <laughs> So the question is going to be, like, can he do that against Blades? Because chances are, almost certainly, Blades has him down on the mat within the first minute, two minutes of the fight. Uh, and the one guy where that logic or mysticism hasn't held up against was Daniel Cormier, who was the best grappler Lewis has ever fought. Uh, Lewis was able to survive a round, but he got choked out about as easily as we thought it would look like in the second round. Cormier was just a very high-level grappler, and Lewis's anti-grappling didn't hold up. And Blades, I, I don't know where I rank him against Cormier. He's a lot bigger to start, so that is going to play a role. He very high-level college wrestling background and very technical. He's just really good at moving his hips as you move his hips keeping his weight above your weight so the entire time you're trying to stand up he's making you carry him while he does it then when you do stand up he just shifts to the next position position gets you right back down and keeps riding you out it's pretty technical it's efficient enough and it's worked against almost everyone who's fought so that's going to be the first question Derek Lewis's bizarre anti-wrestling that's hard to understand versus Blades's technical elite wrestling and we'll see if Lewis has any lessons learned from the Daniel Cormier fight he took it on pretty short notice no one seriously expected him to win so now he's facing a similarly elite grappler let's see how his anti-wrestling holds up in that situation and then on the other side how do you feel about a comparison like where does Lewis's power rank in terms of I mean obviously the biggest a uh, guy in this division is Nganu in terms of like that instant knockout potential. Is he kind of up there with that? And is that something that Blade should be on the lookout for? Yeah, for sure. That's <laughs> what I was about to get to. I, kept, I have to keep saying almost when I talk about Curtis Blades because he's lost two fights in his career, I believe. Two fights in the UFC, at least. And they were both to Francis Nganu. The first time it went over, I think, two rounds and Nganu had punched Lewis in the face so badly that his eyes swelled up and they stopped the fight. And the second time, Lewis was, a, or not Lewis, excuse me, Blades was a favorite to win over Nganu, I believe. And Nganu looked like he was on the out and he began a historic resurgence by knocking out Blades in about 40 seconds. And that's the thing at heavyweight, almost everyone has that knockout power. Uh, Lewis is certainly one of everyone. Okay. It's a bit different because Nganu's power comes from being a sculpted beast who's just an athletic freak. 
whereas Lewis is power. He's not the same type of athlete as Nganu, but he certainly has that power. It's mostly a question of, uh, I'd say, explosiveness. Like Nganu is incredibly explosive. And the downside of that is cardio. He can't do that in the third round in a way that Derek Lewis can. So I said Blades is probably going to have Lewis down in the first minute, two minutes of the fight. And that's because Lewis isn't really a come out and blitz you with one punch type of fighter. He's a always dangerous, always swinging type of fighter. So the power is similar to Nganu, but the instant delivery system is a bit weaker. But I don't want to say Lewis isn't an amazing athlete because he, in terms of kicks, is might be the most explosive wild fighter on the heavyweight roster. He's the only guy I can think of who regularly throws like flying knees, jumping switch kicks. And that has my interest because Curtis Blades is a wrestler who's had to learn how to strike. He striking, you can tell it does not come naturally to him and he's polished his striking very much over the years, but it's very technical that he's doing, he's always trying to think what's the conventional thing to do and how do I do it? So if there's anyone in the heavyweight division that that kind of wild jumping knee shit might work against, it honestly might be uh, Blades. And that brings me to my last point about this fight, which is cardio. Lewis is actually a big reason my sister's into UFC because the Conor McGregor card that I got my whole family to watch with me he was on and he got technically out kickboxed for 14 minutes, a lot like I was telling you about Paul Craig last time. And then with, I want to say 15 seconds left, he swung an overhand, caught Volkov throwing a silly leg kick, but still caught him and put him out with like 10 seconds to go. So that's Lewis. Yeah. And it, that's exactly the sort of story that like grabs you in uh, combat sports and it, Definite, it made him a lot of fans that night, including my sister and my uncle. So Lewis is clearly dangerous up until the last minute of the fight. Blades, his last fight, also against Volkov, makes this very interesting because he put a wrestling clinic on Volkov. As I was describing, just keep going, keep going, bring you down. If you try and stand up, I'm going to ride you, pick you back up and throw you back down. But uh, the last two min- rounds were very interesting because Blades really gassed. He, like, he gave this hilarious post-fight interview where he was like gasping for breath as he was trying to respond. You honestly were kind of concerned about whether he was going to have a heart attack or not during the interview. So I'm really curious to see what Blades does with that as his last fight. Is, is he going to ease up on the power wrestling? Is he going to rest a little more in positions or is he going to look for the finish in the first two rounds because if you put him away you don't have to worry about the fourth or fifth round so blades cardio questions versus lewis's ability to be dangerous up until the last minute of the fight is the last thing that makes this pretty interesting so we'll see then moving on, we got the co-main event, Anthony Lionheart Smith versus Devin Brown Bear Clark. So let me tell you a bit about Anthony Smith first. He had a tough start to mixed martial arts. He went five and five in his first 10 fights. He found his groove and got his record respectable enough to 24 and 11 to enter the UFC, win against a win, a loss, put three wins in a row. And then he got stopped by Tiago Santos, who has since become one of the top five in the light heavyweight division. And then Smith decided to move up to light heavyweight, where he had a first minute stoppage against Rashad Evans, which was impressive enough to let him step up to take the short notice main event against Shogun stopped him in a minute and a half and the light heavyweight division was paper thin at this point but i'll say it for what it is two wins over guys that are over 35 doesn't get you a number one contender spot in many divisions but it did in the light heavyweight 
where he stepped up, took on Volkan Uzdemir, who was just coming off a title challenge loss to Daniel Cormier. And my recollection of that fight is Uzdemir put it on Smith for two rounds, got the better of the exchanges, but Smith's nickname is Lionheart. He can take a beating and then weather it and find a way to win. And that's what he did. He managed to turn it, bring the grappling in the third round and found a rear naked choke to stop Uzdemir and get a title shot against John Jones. Uh, and in that title shot, he was pretty badly outmatched. Jones, who has historically struggled against guys his own size, put it on Smith like he's done to no one else with a similar frame to him. It was kind of disappointing performance from Smith. He's looked back and said, I just wasn't able to pull the trigger, but like Jones spun a kickboxing clinic. He was throwing front kicks, side body kicks, spinning body kicks, knees. Um, and it wasn't too impressive from Smith. Then a year later, he went on, to, or not a year later, excuse me, three months later, he went on to fight Alexander Gustafson and similar to the Ustamir fight, took a beating, especially in the third and beginning of the fourth round. And then Gustafson took Smith down and Smith found a way to grab or got into his realm of grappling where he's quite elite and found a way to get the rear naked choke. Next up, he had a main event against Glover Teixeira. That was the fifth month of this year, so June, where he put it on Teixeira for two rounds. He was vicious world beater pace, and then he gassed, and Glover started piecing him up. And the corner really should have stopped it after the fourth round because Smith had zero chance of winning the fight, but they didn't. They sent him back out, and he got taken out in the first minute of that fight. Went on to take another fight against Alexander Rakic, who threw some devastating leg kicks early, took him to the ground. And we saw that when Smith is on his back, flat or against the cage, he wasn't able to do the same things he did against Gustafsson and Ustamir. So that brings us to now. He's fighting Devin Clark. Now, Devin Clark has got three recent losses in the UFC. They're to Jan Blachowicz, Alexander Rakic, who we just mentioned, and Ryan Spann. Blachowicz is now the light heavyweight champion. Rakic is in the top five, and Spann, I believe, is ranked 12th. So what you see when you look at Clark is a guy who's able to get it done against most of the division, but not the top 15. So this is going to be a check on Anthony Smith. Is he a top 15 fighter or did he just get a bit of luck coming his way in those two signature wins over Uzdemir and Gustafsson? And I really feel like this is Smith's fight to lose. I just watched uh, Devin Clark's last fight against Alonzo Menafield. And what Clark essentially did was against a bigger fighter force a grappling match. He just clearly did not want to be in the center of the octagon striking. So every time he found himself there, he just shot for takedowns, pushed him against the fence. And uh, Menafield showed really poor fight IQ because every time he got the clinch in his favor, got uh, Clark's back against the cage, all he had to do was push him away, back off, bring it back to the center. And I think he probably would have stopped Clark or at least been able to put a beating on him. And he didn't do that. So that's what I'm going to be looking for Anthony Smith to do. He's got, I think, a four-inch height advantage over Clark, so that should really help him in stuffing and grappling, but I expect Clark to push Smith against the cage and try and keep it there. And what I'm going to be looking for Smith is in the center, pushed a similar pace that he pushed against Glover because this is a three-round, not a five-round fight, but maybe 5 10% off those punches. But don't follow him past the black line. Let him come to you when his back is against the cage because that's where Clark doesn't want it, and that's where Smith, Smith should keep it. So this is going to determine the one of these fighters is going to go on to stay in the top 15 and have top 15 matchups, and the other one isn't. If Smith can't beat uh, Clark, it's probably time for him to retire. Damn. The uh, last fight 
I want to bring to your attention is Spike Carlisle, who is going to be making his third UFC fight. And this guy's nickname is Alpha Ginger. And his fighting style is about as crazy as the nickname. He started, he starts the fight and punches the gas 120% and keeps that energy wherever that initial effort takes him. I thought it did enough to win his last fight against Billy Quarantillo, which got fight of the night for being an absolute like barn burner of a grappling match, which doesn't happen too often. But it was a really fun fight to watch. But we'll see what the limits of Carlisle's fight is. I feel like the decision didn't go his way, but he's got that loss on his record. So I'm curious to see what adjustments he makes and how much of that crazy Maverick style he keeps, but very fun fighter to watch. And he's the first fight on the main card for a reason. Knockouts for Jesus. Yeah. So that pretty much wraps up what I've got my eye on for this fight night. Now uh, let's talk about Mike Tyson, Roy Jones Jr. Let's take a quick break. So now we're going to get to into the upcoming main event on the boxing side of the card, uh, going up against that UFC fight night that Max just broke down for us. But what people have been waiting for a long time is to watch two 50-year-old fighters go at it. And I'm not sure that this is actually going to be too exciting, but uh, there's definitely lots of stuff stuff for us to break down here. So, Max, give me your take on this Mike Tyson, Roy Jones Jr. exhibition match or Saturday night pay per view. Yeah, my uh, first reaction was pretty similar to your own. I assume that was sarcasm. Just two guys in their fifties fighting doesn't hold a ton of appeal. But over the past couple of days, I've looked into it and started to get excited. So. I guess I'll start with my own impression of it, which is who is Mike Tyson? And for our generation, we're 22 years old, or you will be soon. Mike Tyson is the guy who was in The Hangover. He's uh, the guy who's Mike Tyson mystery, some kind of animal lover. He's the guy with the face tattoo and the lisp. He's the guy on Comedy Central Roasts. He's, that's the Mike Tyson we've grown up with and come to know in mainstream. But uh, what I've realized or what we're learning as fight week has gone on and we've seen people get excited is there's another Mike Tyson. So I'm going to start there. Who was that Mike Tyson? And to do that, I'm going to reference a excerpt from Flea's memoirs, Flea being the bassist from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. In the afternoon, we picked up Perry Farrell and Casey Nicoli to go watch the Tyson fight at the house of our friend Rick Van Santen. I loved Mike Tyson so much. He embodied our time. Hallie will always be the greatest. He floated like a butterfly and stung like a bee, but Tyson was our champ. Cosmic zeitgeist, overflowing with the pathos of the USA in 1988 and hammering all the punk rock hip-hop feelings we shared into his opponent's skulls. The edgy, vibrating feeling I got when he marched into the ring to Ice Cube. Wow. Full of love for him, yet quaking with terror at the violence he would unleash. My mom was a huge Tyson fan. I always said she wanted to give him the Camille tea with honey in it, put him to bed on time, and keep him away from all the evil sharks surrounding him. He demolished Spinks in a few seconds, and our odd silence erupted in the, a casphony of jokes and speculation. So that's another Mike Tyson that we didn't get to know. And when you learn about that Mike Tyson, you, the first word that comes to mind is kind of animal. That the man was terrifying the way you're terrified if you were locked in the cage with a um, primate. He was violent. He wanted to hurt you. And watching him do that turned him into a cultural phenomenon. But uh, there were problems with that, mainly his ego. He didn't know how to lose. He didn't know how to be afraid. He didn't know how to confront those things and overcome them because he never had to early on in his in the ring. And so when he eventually did come into troubles, he wasn't able to overcome them. When he came into a fight against Buster Douglas and was a bit out of shape and not taking him seriously enough probably. And Douglas put up more of a fight, resisted 
resisted the animal, Tyson didn't know what to do and he got dropped when he fought Evander Holyfield and he didn't like the way things were going, he bit his ear. I asked my dad this morning, what do you think of when you think of Mike Tyson? And that was his answer. So there's this, there's almost three Mike Tysons. There's this early, brash, unchecked, egotistical animal who is the most terrifying thing in existence. There is that same man but with his shortcomings exposed ever falling into weakness and then there's the man he become became i started this clip off talking about that we know this wise sage who's been there done that seen it all thought back reflected on it and become a better man because of it and so what's really got me hyped about this fight is who's going to step into the ring tomorrow Our, is it going to be the ideal mix between the two? Is it going to be the wise sage who knows how to tap into that animalistic rage? Oh, look at me making poetry. <laughs> is, he, is his ego going to get the better of him? Is he going to be so afraid to unleash that ego out that he's going to be tentative? So that's really what's compelling me about this fight, Mike Tyson. But it takes two to tango, and uh, I don't think you can make a much better dance partner from this fight than Roy Jones Jr., which, again, I've gotten into combat sports over the past three, four years, and boxing even more recently than that. So I'm not particularly familiar with Roy Jones Jr. I've, I didn't get to watch him, but uh, the people who did say he might be the pound-for-pound -pound best boxer ever. He to a very unorthodox guy with amazing footwork, amazing reflexes, and amazing speed, who with the top level fight IQ to turn all those things into the biggest advantage he could, and was able to go up weight classes because when you're that fast and that smart, you can neutralize size advantages. So that's what we got. Old versus old, two legends. And uh, let's talk a little about what that means for this fight. Okay. So let me give you my take as someone who knows very little about boxing, but is taking a look at the gambling odds. <laughs> and right. what I see from my preliminary findings is that this is going to be an event, right? This is your McGregor versus Mayweather type boxing showcase that again i don't think it's gonna live up to the hype you've got lil wayne you've got wiz khalifa performing you've got the style bender commentating it's gonna be something that's gonna draw a ton of eyeballs but i think people are gonna be a little bit disappointed with the results uh tyson's fate the favorite right now on many sites which seems silly to me because jones is younger and uh has boxed more recently uh but again it's that the the tyson persona right that you've outlined that make people so excited to bet on him personally i think the best value here is plus 800 for a draw or no contest and and that's where i would put my money because in the end this could end up just being an eight round sparring match maybe there'll be some competitive juices flowing from both the fighters but I mean, at the age they're at, I don't think either of them wants to sustain any of a major injuries. And I mean, at plus 800, that's pretty good value. Just so you could throw like 50 bucks on that. Yeah, let me check you on that for a couple of reasons. So tip, what they say is power is the last thing to go. And what that means is just the when you see fighters get older and older, the one thing they can still rely on to win is their power. They don't have the speed, they don't have the timing, they don't have the explosiveness necessarily, but if they connect, they can still put you out. So the reason, you mentioned their age, but they're only three years apart. Tyson's 54 and Jones is 51. And uh, Tyson's known for his power and Jones had power, but that power was about speed mostly. So when you talk about their strengths in their prime you expect age to have favored tyson's strength a lot more than jones and 
the fighting experience could you could look at it one of two ways you could say well jones is still going to have the juices a lot they've been flowing a lot more consistently for him so he's going to be able to draw on them a lot better but that, there's also a wear and tear factor i mean if you keep fighting you keep going into fight camps consistently throughout the years that does take its toll on you and tyson's had about 10 plus years off from that and i don't think he's treated it the way george st pierre does for example he's not he hasn't stayed in like prime athletic shape even but that break is going to be good and this circles back to that uh wise wisdom point i was making if tyson's done everything right then he might be able to maximize that time off and still step into the ring in fighting shape and his if he still has some explosiveness, he'll definitely still have that power. So if Jones is betting on his reflexes and speed to get him out of danger with Tyson, those might not be good enough if he, uh, depending how good of a fighter we see Tyson step into. Yeah, but I mean, Tyson hasn't fought since 2005, right? Jones fought as recently as 2018. So I just, you can talk about the speed reflexes of Jones deteriorating, but it's also going to be gone in Tyson. And the fact that just Jones has that, like being able to be in a real fight where someone's actually hitting you back. I just, Tyson hasn't had that in 15 years where he's got all these great videos of him smacking the crap out of pads. But as soon as Jones, like if he tags him with something, I think it really changes the complexion of the fight. So I don't know. I'm going to stick with my bet, but I mean, if you got any more reasoning why I should put my money on one guy or the other, be my guest. No, I mean, I, I, if my gut says Tyson, but uh, if the line, if Tyson's a favorite, I don't feel quite confident enough to put any significant money on him. I'd definitely put money on him if he was the underdog, but I think his uh, path to victory is just a little clearer. Like it's, there's not a bad chance he manages to land that punch against a guy who's relied on speed and reflexes. And Dominic Cruz, a UFC fighter, likes to say there's no such thing as ring rust. You've just got to make the right preparation. You've just got to do your camp right. And that's why I keep circling back to what has Tyson learned over the last 10, 20 years of his life? Is he going to have made all those right adjustments? Because I kind of agree with Cruz. I I think if you, with the right fight camp, you can step back in and be just as good, if not better than 15 years. And my main evidence of that is the performance GSP put on against Bisping. He was out of the ring for five years and he came back and his timing was beautiful. Like it looked like he fought six months ago. So best case, I can totally see that for Tyson, but uh, it depends how seriously he treated his camp and is taking this, and we won't find that out till Saturday. Looking forward to it. All Absolutely. right. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, uh, we're going to walk through our contenders in the Eastern Western Conference of the NBA and what we liked and what we didn't like as we sift through the wreckage of free agency. And we are back, and we are going to break down some of our key takeaways, biggest winners, uh, not really much the losers because who cares about the losers, of NBA free agency, which was a whirlwind this week. And I just want to start off by saying in the East, I don't think that much changed. And, and I'm feeling pretty good about where the Raptors stand. Uh, the first team that stood out to me was Milwaukee, right? Because they were the best record in the league last season. And they had concerns going into the playoffs about when it gets to crunch time, what's that lineup going to be? You got Giannis, you have Middleton, and then it's three question marks. And despite the amount of assets that they gave up, I think they end up being one of the winners of the Eastern Conference just because they got another guy to fill one of those question marks. And that was Drew Holiday, who plays some great perimeter defense. And he's a guy you can put the ball in his hands late in games and he can get you a bucket or he can set someone else for a bucket. So uh, I think Milwaukee in that sense won because besides them, there weren't a lot of teams in the East that actually got 
a large margin better. So you have Boston. They lose Hayward, which is really big. They get Tristan Thompson, which fits in nicely there. He can be a great rim runner. He can get a lot of rebounds. But again, I don't think that moves the needle too much on their potential. Uh, Miami, Eastern Conference representatives in the NBA Finals. They lose Jay Crowder, which is really important for them because he can guard threes and fours. Uh, they replace him with Mo Harkless, who frankly is not great. Uh, and then the biggest thing for Miami is they maxed Bam Adebayo, which actually makes their chances of being able to fit Giannis into their cap space uh, a little bit lower because they really will have to do some cap shenaniganery to get him in there, which actually may make him less likely to sign there in Miami. So Milwaukee, biggest winner. And then the other winner I had was Philadelphia. And again, they didn't move their needle too much, but it was more of an addition by subtraction. They moved Richardson, they moved Horford out, and they brought in some shooters. So just it opens up the floor for Simmons and Embiid to go to work. And that was kind of what I like to see. And of course, Daryl Morey is a great general manager. So that was probably honestly their biggest transaction that they made in the offseason was no one on the court, but getting Morey off the court. And Doc oh, Rivers hopefully will be able to, yeah, he'll be able to increase the productivity of those two stars but it, i he had the clippers lose 3-1 they're up 3-1 to the nuggets and they lost so how much is doc rivers going to change that philly team it'll be interesting to see uh do you have any teams that stand out to you in the eastern conference uh not too much but i want to walk back and go over what you just said a little uh so starting with milwaukee I agree with everything you said about Drew being a great addition to them, especially in the playoffs. And my only uh, question for you on that is, do you think adding Drew uh, takes Giannis out of the running for Defensive Player of the Year? No. I mean, the, the thing with Giannis is if if people want to find, because what he does on the defensive end is crazy. He takes up so much space. There's a lot of teams that operate their offense with only 75% of the floor because they want to keep it away from him. Uh, he has the potential to reach like a Kawhi level of defense where he can guard anyone one through five, even though he didn't guard Jimmy in the playoffs this year. Uh, he has that potential. He's long. He's quick. He blocks everything. He can get his length in the passing lane so he can be just as great off the ball as he is on the ball. Uh, and I think what Milwaukee can do with him that will actually help his defensive player of the year case is they will run him a bit more at center than they normally do because that is kind of their peak lineup is having him with the ball and a bunch of people spread out that aren't Brooke Lopez. <laughs> and that way you have that spacing for him to do his thing. I think the biggest argument against defensive player of the year for Giannis is not as Drew, but it's how much usage he gets throughout the season from uh, Mike Budenholzer because he only plays like a max of 36 minutes per game, which really has a ceiling on how much you can impact a game uh, in, on the defensive end. Hmm. I was thinking, uh, yeah, he'll just be more confined. Like with a guy like Drew on the perimeter, it's just going to be natural for him to be more confined to the paint defensively. And that's just, it's going to result in a few less steals, a few less blocks, a little less impact. And don't get me wrong, Milwaukee's defense is better for it. Just Giannis's individual contribution, I feel like, is going to go down a bit. So, And if you ask him, he doesn't care. He just oh, no. wants to win at this point. So, yeah, yeah. That's, I, that's I, right I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. His his defensive player of the year hopes are probably a little bit diminished, but for him, that doesn't matter. His playoff, his ring hopes are better for it, and that's all that matters. Exactly. All right, uh, Miami. I guess when I think of Crowder, I don't think about defense. I thought about threes first, so I guess they've lost something there. But they're pretty uh, deep in three-point shooters between uh, Dragic, Hero, and uh, Robinson. So don't that's forget. not that. Don't that's forget not Kendrick much. Nunn, man. Put some respect oh. on his name. <laughs> Fair enough, my bad. So that I feel like Miami is a team that's just going to be better because, like, Hero and Robinson's confidence, especially, should be way up. If Dragic can do something similar to what he did, then they're just a real contender by the 
standard they set for themselves in the playoffs. So, yeah, they haven't gotten better on paper, but I feel like they've gotten a lot better on the intangibles. So I'm excited to watch that. Well, scared to watch that, but excited. With the culture they have and now the the baseline talent that they have, Miami's always going to be in the hunt in some regard for the playoffs. But I think I think I can make a pretty strong case to myself that they won't just be in the top hunt. They'll like be a top three contender is kind of what I'm expecting to see from them. But Interesting. I don't know. It's going to be on Jimmy Butler's shoulders one way or the other. And I think I see a guy who can carry the team to that level. Uh, as for Boston, I feel like, I don't know, I didn't get to see much of Hayward because he was injured and Boston still played very well. Tatum scares the daylights out of me. I think that guy is a real problem who's going to be even better this coming season than he was in the playoffs, and he was already freaking scary in the playoffs. And Boston's biggest hole, it seemed to me, like was at center. So the addition of Thompson and some height at the five, I think, is going to be a big deal. So Boston's Boston and Miami scare me a little more than you're saying. Yeah, the biggest thing with Hayward for me, and I think I briefly mentioned it on Monday, was just they lose another creator, right? Because now they fill those Hayward minutes with a Marcus Smart or a, well, after that it's Ojale, Williams, whatever. So the biggest thing they lose there is someone who's going to keep the ball moving to find a better shot and the ball will stop with a Marcus Smart or like a Tristan Thompson. It will, but I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, they're mi- I guess they could really use a play creator off the bench, but I think uh, Kemba and Tatum are good enough play creators that you let Marcus Smart sit on that uh, corner three and like they need to guard him. He can hit that shot consistently enough. You let Tristan Thompson sit in the post, they need to guard him. That's good enough. So their starting lineup, I think, is going to have no issues with play creation. They might be lacking that a little in depth, but uh, come crunch time, I don't see that being an issue for them. Uh, Moving on to Philly, the moves they made interested me quite a lot because on paper, it doesn't really look like they've gotten any better. Like they gave up uh, Richardson and Horford shit I didn't label the names but this is Horford so last season he put up 30 minutes 12 points 45 percent field goal 35 percent three-point shooting 6.8 rebounds four assists 0.8 steals 0.9 blocks they traded him for green who in 25 minutes put up three less points a four percent less field goal percentage roughly the same three-point percentage half the rebounds quarter of the assists, a little more steals and less blocks. Now, I think it's something of a, and they're, I think, one year apart in age. So I think that's something of a gamble on Maury's part that uh, Green is going to have a bigger role to play. And if you give him more minutes, he'll be able to look more like he did with the Raptors the season before, which (laughs) the main thing that stands out is his three point percentage was 10% higher. Yeah, so the biggest thing with Green and Horford, right, is Horford, is a he's going to clog everything in that Philadelphia system. You can't run Horford and Embiid at the same time. It's two centers. So with Horford there, at the money that he was making, he just he, he ruined the spacing in that offense. And they tried working it with him coming off the bench, and it just didn't work. So he was too expensive of an asset. They clear out that space because they may be on in on Harden, which we'll get to later. And they get rid of a guy who just clogs up their spacing. And Danny Green at least provides a credible threat to be an outside shooter and provides a little bit more of that perimeter defense, which they need after they traded Richardson. So, yeah, I just think in that regard, it was really important. And they had to offload a first-round pick to get rid of Horford. But, I mean, that contract was deemed by a lot of people to be untradeable so I think it's a win that they got it off their books right do you think they uh suffer at all then from less depth at center well th- that's the thing with Philadelphia is now they have those two big dudes so Embiid can play a ton of minutes at center 
And then they've got Ben Simmons, who they could, in theory, run at center in a small ball lineup. But, I mean, looking at their lineup, they lose Horford, but they get more of a defined backup center in Dwight Howard to fill yes. that space. I didn't like that move because outside of the Lakers, I don't think Dwight fits anywhere because there's no one who's going to be able to alpha dog him and tell him to do his role because he's a dude that's out there in terms of personality. And LeBron and Anthony Davis were kind of the guys who could get him to settle down and do his job. So I worry about that for the Sixers. But if Dwight can play like he did last year on the Lakers, then I think that's a great role for him as the backup center who's going to fill in for Embiid, who, again, will probably get a bit of a minutes restriction for the Sixers this season. Yeah, I mean, action speaks louder than words, so we'll see about Howard. But I was I, I was a huge Howard fan back in the day for pretty arbitrary reasons, but I'd have his jersey anyway. And so I was looking up him and uh, reading what he was saying and what he said was what I realized after the season is the thing that matters most is holding up that cup and getting that ring. It's not about the minutes I play. It's not about the role I'm in. It's not about how much I'm doing. It's about winning. So if he can take that mentality and keep it going in, and it sounds like he has a ton of respect for Embiid, then uh, I think your fears could be baseless, but we'll see what he does. I'll believe it when I see it. Fair enough. And then the last move was uh, Richardson for Curry, which similar story in the stats similarity between the two. Uh, Richardson was playing more minutes, but pretty similar across the board, except Richardson's defensive numbers, especially the blocks look better. The big difference then is a 10% uh, higher three point percentage for Curry. So, I mean, Maury loves his three ball and uh, we'll see if he's learned anything from his time in Houston and how to implement that a little better. It's a similar story with the Horford trade, right? You're moving out a guy who maybe provides you some better defense and some better rebounding. And you're bringing in a guy who can shoot it better. And I think the stats that they lose with a Richardson and a Horford moving out, they actually get up made for by their stars. So Embiid and Simmons stats, I think, have the potential to go up because they'll have more spacing around them to do the things that they do. So we'd say this trade works out great for Philly if uh, we see similar stats coming from those guys, but like the three-point shooting lets Embiid and Simmons go to work in the paint a little more. And maybe we have pretty similar levels of production, but it's about the type of play and they're going to be a lot closer to the kind of ball Maury wants to see played. Exactly. All right. Moving on, you want to talk about Atlanta? Yeah, so Atlanta is a team that has their point guard of the future in Trey Young, and they missed out on Luka Doncic, which will be an all-time miss for them because I believe Luka is going to be on the Mount Rushmore of basketball players when all is said and done. Uh, But they have Trey Young, who's nice, and he's offensively – yeah, offensively, he's an all-star. Defensively, trash, uh, to be blunt. But what Atlanta did is very indicative of a team whose front office is pressuring them to make the playoffs now. And I think their window is a little bit further along, or not as far along as front offices believes it to be. And so that's why you saw them make some moves. Gallinari... Solid player, too much money for someone who's never been an all-star. And he does some good things for them. I don't think he helps them on the defensive end, which is what you need when you have Trey Young as your point guard. Bogdanovich. This one I actually really love because he provides some playmaking. He provides some excellent shooting at that at that two-guard position. And he's a little bit longer. He's not a plus defender, but he can make up for some of the shortcomings that Trey has on the defensive end of the floor. Rondo, backup point guard. Similar issues with Dwight is how is he going to deal with an atmosphere of a team that isn't full of alpha dogs like AD, LeBron, etc. Because Rondo worked really well with them, but in this new scenario, he might 
his his personality might be too big for their locker room and i mean he doesn't shoot well in their system so i just i i don't know how i see that move fitting in uh alternatively at the guard position they also got chris dunn which blew under the radar but is actually a great move because chris dunn is deceptively one of the better perimeter defenders at the guard position in the league and he really stepped up last year for the bulls uh so this is again a move i think they made in order to help trey young on the defensive end because chris dunn can take the bigger tougher assignments at the guard position you can hide trey a little bit more uh and i mean besides that atlanta the moves are all right but i think their ceiling is kind of a seven to eight seed in this Eastern conference where a lot of those teams stayed steady or got a little bit better. I don't think any of those top seven teams are really going to drop out of that playoff picture. So it'll be interesting to see how Atlanta does when they are pushing for the playoffs this year. Fair enough. I don't have much to add for that. I guess I'll just ask you, uh, what's the, what has to happen from Gallinari and Bogdanovich for it to have been the right move and what happens most likely in your opinion that makes it the wrong move? Well, so Gallinari just has to keep up that same production that he's had the last couple of years in Los Angeles and Oklahoma city. Uh, He's going to be your kind of bubble all-star player who puts up decent offensive numbers. And then on the defensive end, he just has to be a body that can stay in front of his matchup. Um, besides that, they can't rely on him too much more than that. The biggest one to see will be Bogdanovich because a lot of people are high on him and his ability to take a big step forward because he had to split a lot of his role with, uh, Buddy Heald and De'Aaron Fox in Sacramento. So in this new role, he might actually have some opportunity for growth. The problem is, is Trey has the ball in his hands a lot of the time. So now with Bogdanovich, maybe it gives him some potential to move off the ball and Bogdanovich running a little bit more of that offense. So that'll be a big thing. If, if Bogdanovich takes the leap that people expect him to make, then that Atlanta team actually looks a lot nicer than what I'm talking about him right now. Do you think uh, they should have stayed a year and seen if they could have picked up Gian- been in the race for Giannis because Trey Young and Giannis on the same team would be terrifying. It would be nice. I I don't think Giannis has them in his sights in terms of teams that he's looking at. So, And they had pressure for management. They had a ton of cap space this year. And so they kind of went in looking to make the playoffs. Um, they didn't give up a realistic opportunity by making these signings. Yeah. And, and, and they drafted Okongwu, who I think is going to be a great prospect. Uh, but besides that, they didn't give up any of their future. They just made a ton of signings, which may hinder them in terms of cap flexibility down the line, especially when they're probably going to have to max Trey when his rookie deal's up. Uh, So in that sense, their long-term isn't hindered that much, but I just think it's a lot of money to spend on some of these guys for a team that ceiling is not, like, I don't think they'll make it to the second round. All right. Then last up is Brooklyn. So give me your thoughts. (laughs) Or actually, I'll go first. What, And mainly, I don't really know what to expect from Brooklyn because the core of that team we haven't seen yet. We haven't gotten to see uh, Kyrie and KD play together. And uh, I guess the thing that I'm wondering most is what are uh, Levert and Dinwiddie going to do when KD steps up? Are they going to be able to maintain that production that they had, which was pretty good but uh they're gonna have less room to do that so what's the Kyrie KD gonna core gonna look like and what can we expect from uh Dinwiddie and Levert so the ceiling of this team is how good Kevin Durant ends up being coming back from injury if he is the same or 90 percent of the Kevin Durant of old then this team instantly becomes a finals contender if the injury hinders him then they're going to slide down the rankings because I just don't think Kyrie has the ability to carry a team. It has to be from Durant in terms of Dinwiddie and Levert. uh, I think honestly, one of them gets dealt before the season's done. They might operate with them at the beginning of the season, but 
there's four guys right there with your Kyrie, your KD, Dinwiddie, Levert, who all need the ball in their hands to really generate offense, and they can all go get you a bucket. So it's going to be tough when it comes down to crunch time who you want to rely on to to run with the ball. And so I think you could see a Dinwiddie or a Levert get moved for a, another piece that fits in better with those those two core pieces of Kyrie and KD. Yeah, and I mean, Kyrie's ego is for sure not going to let him trust uh, Dinwiddie or Levert in the situation you're describing. So there could be some tension there, or they could understand the kind of guy Kyrie is and accept the role that he is dictating to them. But uh, I'm, I'm not too interested in talking about any of the other moves Brooklyn has made in free agency, but I am interested in discussing James Harden. So do you, I'll just ask you this. Do you see it being possible to move Dinwiddie, Levert, and maybe a first or two firsts for Harden? Well, I think it's definitely possible. In this new era of the NBA, guys go where they want to go. They end up forcing to where they want to go. You've seen it with the most. The two most recent examples have been Anthony Davis and D'Angelo Russell, right? When they get a sense of where they want to go, those teams who a have the assets are become limited in where they can get value for them because the team that the other teams that aren't where that player wants to go immediately know that they will probably only get that guy for one year and that's and then he'll leave in free agency and hey that worked out amazing for us the Raps. <laughs> yeah yeah with Kawhi for sure that was they didn't want to deal him to a western competitor and that's how he landed in our lap but the thing with Anthony Davis was he was only going to go the Lakers at that point. And so, I mean, the Pelicans got lucky that they were able to get so much back for him, but that's your generational player that you've lost. And I don't know. They're lucky in the lottery. They got Zion, but besides that, I don't know if any of those guys they got back would have ever replaced AD. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see, with Harden, I think Brooklyn's going to have to give up a ton more. I think it's going to be one of Dinwiddie and Levert and then Jared Allen and then maybe Joe Harris, and then it's going to be like four or five picks. Yep. It'll be two firsts and then your pick swaps in between, so that way they get around the Stepien rule. And uh, it just – I don't know if that works out for Houston, right? Because James Harden is a top three MVP candidate every year. He leads the league in scoring. He is a generational offensive talent. So in terms of Brooklyn being in the mix, it's possible because that's where Harden wants to go and NBA players have found a way to get what they want. But I think if you're looking at realistic trades, I think Philly has a chance to be in more so than Brooklyn. But how do you feel about this trade really working out? Like, let me throw you this trade. Instead of all those Brooklyn pieces, what if Philly offers Ben Simmons, uh, who they draft, Tyrese Maxey, and then a first-round pick? Do you think Houston does that? I don't know. I think then it depends what direction Houston's looking at going. I mean – if they want to win now, Ben Simmons isn't a bad choice to try and go with to lead that ship because he's still getting better, but he can be a start. But you kind of have to, I feel like, do a little rebuild, a quick rebuild around Simmons because I don't think adding Simmons to that team does enough, but he's the kind of player where if he's on your team, you want to win now. So if I feel like Houston's in a really tough dilemma where – I can't really think of a trade for Harden that lets them have a real shot at like top four in the East or sorry, West. So in that position, I'd almost want to trade Harden for a more uh, long-term yeah. type the player. And so I think that would mostly look like draft picks, but then you're trading Harden for draft picks. You got to think that uh, those won't be great draft picks. Yeah. So that's that's kind of why I like the idea behind uh, Levert and Dinwiddie, because if they're willing to play second fiddle to Russ Westbrook, that could be pretty interesting, and you could see Westbrook kind of replicate that OKC MVP year, but maybe 
a little less ego with a little more from those two. But then I agree, they still need to get more back from Harden than that. So you find a way to bring a third team into it and get some draft picks. That's, but you're right, it does depend. Well, it sort of depends what Harden wants. Ultimately, management can do what they think is best. And if they trade Harden to a team, he doesn't, or does he have a right to sign off on the trade? I well, so the he has got two years on his contract, and if they he doesn't have a like a no trade clause in his contract, yeah. he he'll have to go wherever they send him. Yeah. So but, if I'm Houston, that's how I'm thinking about it. Like I don't yeah, really yeah. care where Harden wants to go; I just want to get the best value for him. Yeah, and and that's kind of my final takeaway too: is if he wants to go to Brooklyn so bad, you're making sure that you're not getting picks now. You're making sure you're getting picks four years from now. Because by then, in this era, all those guys will be gone. And I don't think Brooklyn will be that top-tier contender. So you want to make sure you get picks further down the line. That will probably provide you with more value. You, kind but, of want to, you might want to <laughs> hedge your bet on Kyrie. Like, you yeah. can make a plausible argument that uh, this team self-destructs in the next two years. So maybe it's worth hedging the bet for a first, I'd say, next year. And it's possible. Yes. The but last I, thing yeah. I'd want to add is that uh, it'll be drawing off what you said about Harden will probably go where Harden wants to go. It'll be interesting to hear how much he wants to play for Philly and be under Maury's leadership again. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. That's the other thing is Fertitta is not going to be happy if Houston sends Harden back to the general manager that he just fired, right? I don't think he's going to like seeing that. So that might be the biggest thing that prevents this trade from happening. Okay, we will take a quick break, and then we will break down the West. And what stood out to us there? Let's take a look at the West, shall we? So, Max, my friend, what stood out to you? from free agency in the Western Conference? The big move in the West that stood out to me was the addition of Steven Adams to the Pelicans. I, wow. I'm very curious to see what the paint combination between uh, Adams and Zion is going to look like because I feel like Adams is just such a pure strength type player. And then Zion has that strength mixed with crazy athletic acceleration and speed so i'm really curious to see what that looks like on defense especially like with adams just being this central pillar holding it down and then you can have zion zinging around the place being just as strong but providing some mobility and that could look like a really solid paint if uh, they can get adams to do a bit of blocking and a bit of rebounding very well in a very small section of the court and then trust Zion to the rest of the outside of that space. Then on defense, they've lost Drew, which is a huge uh, loss in their defensive perimeter ability. But uh, hey, last podcast, you were talking about how impressed you can be with uh, Lonzo Ball's defense. Yeah. So, so I'll bring it to you there. What do you think on um, the perimeter defense of Bledsoe and Ball is going to look like? So, I mean, two years ago, Bledsoe made an all defensive team, right? So he's the, the thing is, people love to talk about what Bledsoe doesn't do well because he was kind of a big part of Milwaukee not reaching their full potential. But in a younger New Orleans team with less expectations, Drew is the better defender and probably the more underrated defender, but Bledsoe is still a physical guy who can guard those small point guards, those quick point guards, and do a really effective job getting in their grill. So I don't think they actually lose too much in the perimeter defensive side because Ball's already a solid defender when he's locked in, and then Bledsoe's going to provide that defense. The only worry is there's less shooting in that in that perimeter uh, scoring now. There's less shooting from both of those guys, and that might give Zion some trouble when he's trying to operate because he's going to face more double teams, especially if you have those three guys on the court, Bledsoe, Ball, and Adams. It's really going to clog things up. Even Brendan Ingram's not that great of a shooter. 
So they might need to work on some stuff there. And I think probably Bledsoe and, and uh, will get moved further down the line during this season because I just think they need to put some more shooting around Zion. And then the biggest thing I loved about this Adams deal was that, again, similar to last year when they had Derek Favors, they need a guy who's going to be a pro and who's going to take on a lot of that work that they don't want to put on Zion yet in terms of banging down in the paint and taking that physical punishment of meeting guys at the rim and setting hard screens. Those are all things that Adams does really well. And he's going to be a grown up in that room and teach those younger Pelicans players how to be a pro. Uh, and so that was kind of the biggest thing that I loved about that move. Yeah. That, and <laughs> can circle back to blood. So, and um, ball do you like best case for new Orleans blood. So can, in part, some of that uh, defensive mentality to Ball and Ball can take some of the next step forwards he needs to with that kind of veteran leadership in the locker room. Definitely. I'm very intrigued by, uh, I don't know if that'll be their starting five or Bloodsoe comes off the vet bench, but I am very intrigued by it. Well, I mean, I'm a little bit biased here, but I want to see Mr. Canadian himself, Nikhil Alexander Walker, start for the Pelicans next season. I don't know how realistic that is, but that'd be nice to see. A little CanCon. I would love that CanCon, bud. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. Who else you got? Who you got your eye on in the West? I mean, same as the Eastern Conference. When you're the number one seed and you can manage to get better, that automatically makes you the winner, right? So, of course the Los Angeles Lakers have to be the biggest winner of free agency for me across the league because they just won the title and they add the two top finalists for the sixth man of the year award. And they improve at, so they, I think Wes Matthews at this point is an upgrade over Danny green, similar shooting, but I think Wes Matthews provides a little bit better defense for them. Dennis Schroeder, way better player than Rondo is in his career right now. And he is a guy who can score for you down the stretch and play make for you when LeBron's not on the court. And Montrezl Harrell, a lot of people are worried about how this move's going to work out in terms of spacing with Anthony Davis. But I think the biggest part of this move actually was with the shortened off season that the Lakers have right now, Harrell and Schroeder will be able to step in and take on more responsibility early in the season so that LeBron and Davis can take nights off. And so you have a little bit of that load management there where you're saving them for the playoffs and having these two guys that can create for you on any given night is super, super important. And it's a big upgrade over what they had in McGee Howard and, uh, and Rondo. Yeah. And you haven't even mentioned Gasol yet. Yeah, we talked about what he what he did for the Raptors on Monday, but the biggest thing for the Lakers that he provides is a little bit of that outside shooting presence and then uh, a little bit of that playmaking and similar defense. He's not going to go up and block shots like a McGee and Howard, but he's so good at staying vertical and just being a big body in the paint that alters shots. And even at his age, he's still incredibly effective on the defensive end of the floor. And a lot of people talk about his communication and really quarterbacking that defense. So the Lakers are going to be fine in terms of defense. And it seems like they've upgraded in terms of shot creation and playmaking on the offensive end. So how can, how can they not be the winners if you've won the finals and you get better in the off season? Yeah, that's, they got favorites for sure heading in. The other team in the West that stood out to me as getting better rather than staying pat uh, was Portland Trailblazers. And they did some moves on the periphery of their roster, but I think it's going to help them out a lot. They acquire Robert Covington, who's going to provide a great 3 and D presence, which they haven't had in a long time. They tried Trevor Ariza last year. He didn't make it to the bubble. And besides that, they've been piecing together Mario Hazonia and God knows what else. They have Gary Trent Jr., but he's a little bit undersized. And so Covington can provide that wing who can guard bigger uh, threes and fours for them, which is really nice. They also get Derek Jones Jr., who can't shoot. But again, another guy who if you need someone to come in and play some defense and take a couple fouls, he can do that for you. 
And then they also traded for Yanis Cancer, who, again, spark plug. During This is more of a regular season move, but off the bench, he can score you 20 points, 15 rebounds on certain nights. And basically, the Blazers are getting better in the regular season, and then they acquired those kind of pieces that'll help them in the playoffs because it's going to be tough for them to sign any big-name free agents, but if they're able to provide a supporting cast where you can let Dame and CJ take over, then I think they have a shot to actually be one of the top contenders. We don't forget, they made it to the conference finals two years ago, so it's definitely possible. Yeah, fair enough. And then the last team that stood out to me, and I think you like these guys too, uh, were the Phoenix Suns. And of course, the big move that they made was getting Chris Paul. Uh, and I think that's going to immediately elevate their floor as a team because of his leadership and his playmaking ability. And he'll be able to find Booker and get Booker the shots that he needs. And that'll help Booker take a big step this year. It's also going to help DeAndre Ayton in the pick and roll because of Chris Paul's, he's the point god, right? <laughs> He's going to be able to make everyone on that team better. But then the other move that was low-key kind of slid under the radar that I loved is they got Jay Crowder, which paired with Bridges, paired with uh, Cam Johnson, just provides another big wing for them to be able to guard a lot of those great wings in the Western Conference. And so uh, I think that's an underrated move that they made that's really going to help their starting lineup. Uh, and so Phoenix, I think, actually is looking pretty good going into next season and could contend for one of those middle seeds in the West. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we should be having this discussion about any team in the West. Okay, what can you do against the Lakers? And uh, I feel like the it's a bit of a paradox right now because the biggest hole I see in the Lakers is outside the three-point line. I I think that's where you beat them offensively by having knockout three-point shooting. But the paradox is you need to be able to defend them in the paint and not just in the paint, but at the mid-range game of Anthony Davis, adding Marc Gasol adds a whole new wrinkle to that. Obviously, LeBron's going to be dangerous anywhere. So how do you construct a team that's good enough defensively three through five to stop this huge Lakers team but good enough offensively to be a lights out shooter from the three point line. And, you know, Devin Booker, Chris Paul, Jay Crowder, they can get the offense done. Let, I mean, I'm not so optimistic about the defensive prospects, but uh, see what Crowder and Aiton can do. And they also had Jalen Smith with their 10th pick, who is a pretty good three point shooter for a big. So, Obviously, he's going to be young and not be able to provide that defensive stopper that you need for those guys, but he adds another dynamic where you can space the floor with him and get Booker some of that inside lane that he needs to score at the bucket. So uh, Phoenix, bright future Suns, might be the bright now Suns. Um, I mean, let's see how much they can carry that uh, bubble mentality going forward too. Yeah. That's got to that's gotta be a chip on your shoulder to have a – have that happen to you what did they go 10 and 0 8 and 0 undefeated and then they just missed out but they're just happy and honestly it just puts a little bit more pressure on them to compete this season uh, which is I I don't know if that's the best thing for them but they have they haven't made the playoffs in a long time it's been a while since exciting things have happened in Phoenix so I'm just happy that they actually look to be having a decent shot at the playoffs this year, especially with that extra play-in tournament, there'll be more, more opportunity to capture one of those like nine, 10 seeds. And that, that is kind of the biggest takeaway from the West is that everyone in that conference, except for Oklahoma City, are going to be competing for a playoff spot. One through 14, all of those teams have aspirations of making the playoffs. But I'm actually going to want to talk about Oklahoma City now because they be did what ev- <laughs> yeah they did what everyone thought they were going to do last year and blow it up. They did it this off season. Only Shea is left from that picture that they took last season with all those guys, uh, and of course another Canadian, so he is elite. Um, but it's just going to be exciting to see how Oklahoma City builds from ground up here because they are plummeting towards that number one draft pick because this twenty twenty one draft is going to be deep and it's going to be full of franchise chasing players. Uh, 
two nights ago, Kate, Cade Cunningham, the projected number one overall pick, played his first game with Oklahoma State, dropped a double-double. He's a 6'8 point guard who plays fluidly. He's got great ball skills. He is like Russell Westbrookian in transition, but he actually has a jump shot too. And, and what I've heard is that he had an average shot in his last year of high school and going into his first game with Oklahoma State, they talked about him being probably the best shooter on the team. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what he does. And, and obviously, Oklahoma City is looking to drop down. And if they could pair him with Shea, there's potential there where you have your two guards being 6'7", six, 6'8", six, and those are the smallest guys on the court for you. So it'll be fun to see what Oklahoma City does to – manage to get their way down to the bottom there and who knows maybe they'll package together one of their 17 first round picks in the next five years to get that number one number two pick because there's also some other guys in that top five who could be franchise changing players yeah I mean they're in such an enviable position when you give up on the present for the future and then you somehow acquire all those draft picks which just sounds hard to believe when you say it out loud but I feel like everyone's going to be rooting for Oklahoma over the years because everyone wants to put themselves into the, the armchair of the Oklahoma City GM and the freedom is limitless so yeah Sam Presti's looking like Thanos with all the draft picks it's going to be uh fun all season this reality can couple be seasons anything that I want <laughs> yeah for sure all right, that kind of wraps up our West analysis. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the Raps. Uh, we missed them on Monday. They picked up Alex Len, DeAndre Bembry, both good depth moves uh, that provide a little bit of what the Raptors need. I don't think it's going to move their needle too much, but um, both are solid players who will get minutes in their rotation, and uh, Alex Len is your dollar store JV, and DeAndre Bembry is similar provides similar uh, skill set to Hollis Jefferson, which means he probably won't be back at the end of the year. Um, and then in terms of Raptors talk, we'll just have to wait. The wave deadline is on Sunday. They've already waived Dewan Hernandez. We'll see if they waive Terrence Davis, what they do there with that situation. But on Monday, we'll have a clear picture of what the Raptors roster is going to look like moving into the season. Uh, besides that, I don't know if you got anything left to add. No, I think you summed it up pretty well. Awesome. It was great talking to you, buddy. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll see you guys on Monday.